Hello everybody, Carl Larson here with a Horizon Replacement Tutorial using Mocha for After Effects version 2. Why replace the Horizon? Well, first because we can, and second because it's difficult shots like this that really demonstrate the powerful features of Imagineer's products. So in this tutorial, we'll be using Mocha for After Effects and the Mocha Shape for After Effects plugin to artificially interrupt the circle of life and relocate a seal colony from its shark infested waters to an alpine safe haven. And if we do it right, our audience won't even know we pulled a bait and switch on them. So let's get to it. To begin a new project, click on the New Project button. Navigate to the clip you want to import. This can either be a movie file or an image sequence, and click OK. Next, we can name the project. I'll call the Seals 2 and then choose a location to save the project. We can either choose Relative Path, which places the file in the same directory as the footage, or Absolute Path, where we can place the project anywhere we like. I'll choose Relative Path and click Next to continue. In the second pane of the wizard, we can specify frame size, bit depth, and the length of our shot, but let's accept the defaults and click the Next button again. In the final pane of the wizard, we can specify interlacing, color space, and timing attributes. But again, let's accept the defaults and get to work. One thing to note here is that if you want to change a project settings after clicking through the wizard, you can always adjust them in the Clip tab at the bottom of the interface. Now that we have our footage loaded in, let's take a look at it. So the camera's moving through 3D space. It zooms, there's a good deal of motion blur, and there really isn't any obvious, unobscured tracking feature on the horizon for us to use for the duration of the shot. Wow, yeah, this would definitely be a difficult track using a point tracker, and it should be pretty approachable using Mocha. So scrubbing through the footage, let's find a frame where the camera is zoomed out, we see the majority of the background, and there's minimal motion blur. Let's choose the last frame. Since all of the rocks in the back are roughly the same distance away from the camera, we'll begin our tracking session by simply grabbing a spline tool at the top of the interface, either the X spline or the B spline, and start drawing a shape around one of the rocks in the background. Click anywhere you'd like to begin a spline. Make it large enough to enclose nearly the whole thing, including any high contrast features when possible, and then right click to close the selection. Technically, each rock in the background sits at a different distance from the camera but they lie within roughly the same planar region, so we can get away with it. So adding additional planes to the layer, all on different rocks, should give us an average track of the overall background movement, which is exactly what we want. So back in the toolbar, click on the Add X Spline, or Add B Spline, to Layer Tool, and let's add another spline to the large rock behind the seals. Assuming these two regions are roughly coplanar, we'll be able to get solid tracking information as one spline moves out of the frame, and the other moves into frame. Now before I run the track, I'm going to be sure I only track translation, scale, and rotation for the layer, not shear or perspective. That's because when we bring the tracking data into After Effects, I know I'm going to paste it onto a null object instead of using the corner pin effect. And a null object can only understand the first three properties anyways. But another advantage to doing this is that it keeps the resulting tracking grid square to the camera as it calculates a solution. And in this specific case, that type of tracking constraint will give us more useful results in our 2D composite. So with Shear and Perspective turned off, click the Track Backward button and run the track. Once we get about halfway through the shot, let's stop the track and add one more tracking spline to the layer, just for good measure. This will help us get more accurate results as the camera zooms in on the seals. Now click Track Backwards again and complete the track. Now that the track is complete, we can see the track is held beautifully. Even though we have a bird and a seal's head moving through the second and third regions, the combined search area was large enough to disregard the erroneous movements of these objects and give us a really nice result. Great. Now like I said, it looks like our track is held really well. Think. Scrubbing through a shot, it's fairly difficult to evaluate the effectiveness of the track with all the zooming and shaking of the camera. So with our layer selected, let's click on the Stabilize button in the View Control Palette and scrub through the clip again. Wow. That is a great looking track especially considering the source material and the fact that the rocks are mathematically on different planes. Now before we get any farther, let me take you on a quick tour of some of the tools that we're going to be using regularly throughout the rest of this tutorial. First, to zoom the image, you can grab the Zoom tool from the toolbar, or just press Z on the keyboard to temporarily activate it. To pan the image, you can grab the Hand tool or press X on the keyboard. Let's also turn on the surface controls so we can have another means of evaluating the track. We can adjust position of the grid by grabbing the blue bars between the corners or by positioning the corners individually. 
Typically, the surface controls are used to determine the location of the corner pin data upon export, but I'm going to use it to line up the grid with the horizon just to be sure we don't have any slip in our track. Essentially, what we're looking for here in the stabilized view is that we don't have any abrupt shakes or zooms in our footage. If we do, that's a good indicator we want to go back and readjust our track before we move on. With a proper track, the stabilized view should give us a stabilized view of our tracked object. If that's not happening, something went wrong. Also, something to note about the stabilize function is that it's an evaluative preview only. That means you can't directly export the data from the stabilize button when we round trip to After Effects. But it's a really handy tool inside of Mocha, and we'll use it a lot more when we get into rotoscoping. But for now, I'm going to accept our track the way it is. Typically, the best workflow in Mocha is to track the scene, evaluate its effectiveness, refine the track using the adjust track module, and then rotoscope based on the adjusted track data. However, since we're making an average track for the movement of the background, based on the motion of several objects that lie on slightly different planes, it's going to be mathematically impossible to give us a perfect track across the entire frame. In fact, my experience has told me, in preparing this tutorial, that I'll only make the track worse if I attempt to adjust it on my own. So for this shot, and this shot only, I'm more concerned about making sure the tracking data stays locked to the horizon on the y-axis than I am about eliminating every little bit of slip in tracking on the x-axis. But just let me reiterate, in a typical workflow, it's best to use the adjust track module whenever possible. But for this example, I'm going to skip it and keep going. So now that we're happy with our track, let's go over to the Layers Control Palette and rename our layer Background Track. And just for safekeeping, let's lock the layer and turn off the tracking cog just to be sure we don't change anything on it by accident in the future. Alright, so the next thing we need to do is use our tracking information to help us cut out the sky so we can actually do the horizon replacement. Now, just like any other type of rotoscoping project, we'll want to break our horizon into manageable pieces instead of trying to do it with one large shape. And just so things don't conflict visually as we go forward, let's turn off the visibility of the tracking layer. Turning this off will not affect our ability to attach a rotospline to it later on. So back at the end of the timeline, let's grab the X-spline tool again and begin to do some roto work. Let's zoom in on the rock, pan over a bit, and just like before, clicking anywhere with the spline tool activated will create a new layer in the layer controls palette. Let's draw a precise mask to enclose the rock on the right hand side of the frame, and right click to close the spline. Right clicking on any tangent handle will select all the points in the spline. Now we can smooth out the overall shape by simply pushing in on the tangent handles. Scrubbing through the timeline, we can now see that our new roto shape is doing nothing. There's one more step we need to do to get our roto shape to stick to the rock. We need to link it to the background track layer in the Layer Properties palette. If we had gone ahead and adjusted the track, we'd want to be sure that we checked the Link to Adjusted Track box. But since we didn't, we'll leave it unchecked. Scrubbing through the timeline again, we'll want to be sure our roto shape stays connected to the rock we traced until it moves entirely out of frame. To do this, it's helpful to change some of the view controls in the main window. Let's turn on the mats and colorize options in the view control palette and scrub through the timeline again. If our shape were slipping, all we'd have to do is select the offending points and move them into their correct positions as we move through time. And each time we do this, a new keyframe is created in the timeline, since the auto key function is on by default. Next, we'll want to evaluate our edge. Currently, everything we've done up to this point has an extremely hard edge, but it's tough to tell in this view. So over in the View Control Palette, toggle off the Colorize button and Overlays, and you'll see what I'm talking about. We'll definitely want to feather that out. To do this, let's set our edge width to minus 3, and click Set. I'm choosing a negative value so that our feathering goes inside the shape instead of increasing the overall size. Now scrubbing through, notice how this only added edge feathering to that one keyframe. Now it may be great if we have an individual object with sporadic motion and we're trying to do something fancy, but we'll want to apply feathering to all the values in our keyframes throughout this shot. So let's redo that change with the Uber key selected. Unlike the Auto key function that only applies our changes to an individual keyframe, the Uber key applies a change to all keyframes between the in and out point in the shot. And since we currently don't have separate in and outs defined, that means we'll be affecting everything in our timeline. Which is absolutely great in this situation, and even better if we had 20 keyframes set and wanted to modify one small parameter. But just be aware, the Uber key is powerful, but dangerous. You can really mess things up in a hurry if you leave it on by accident. So with the Uber key turned on, let's set the edge width to minus 3. Now as we scrub through, the edge width is consistent throughout the shot. Next, let's continue to add roto shapes to our scene until we isolate the entire horizon. And just as a note, I'm going to forget about isolating the individual seals in this demonstration just to keep things moving along. 
It's certainly not impossible, but I don't want to make this overly complicated with several